um, persons, the, the prostitutes um, catch AIDS, like for example, the, the epidemic in New Kingston. Right. Um, you find so a you, lot of us in that area. So could right. we that? And then from there now, the students will pick out the, the main points and create a leaflet. About right. Leaflet. So, so we would give them different. So the prostitution would be one. It could be a situation of a pregnant mother passing it on to her child because she's not, you know, properly um, vaccinated at that point. It could be a situation of... Um, drug abuse we know that drugs you know the use of the same needle so what we do then is look for different access points where aids um, can come into play agreed the students are placed in groups they're given these and they now need to pull the information together to create or design this leaflet so it may not look and why i'm why i'm saying you could get away from the article part of it is because they're so used to articles and, and things like that. And they're going to keep coming up, especially if you're teaching a CSET class. They're going to keep coming up. They're going to keep needing to do them. And so sometimes you could just give them a break with it. They're still de dealing with the summary writing skills. They now have to pull this information together. It's an information leaflet. So they can't spend the time just simply being all emotional about it, can they? They now have to provide information to cause people to be aware about AIDS. Again, another, another thing that could come up here is the checklist. I, and I, you notice I use, I say it a lot because I think it's extremely useful. It just helps them to know what you're looking for. So they get the checklist and they need to have all of these different things um, in the leaflet. Okay. Does the leaflet tell you, give you a definition of the disease? Does the leaflet do that? Does the leaflet do that? And you have them checking off. So that's fine. Summary skills activated. They're also learning. It's relevant. It's something they can carry outside of the classroom. No problem. Good. So that's what I want to hear. I want to begin to, to what I want is I want you guys to start thinking outside of the box. The, the most natural answer here is persuasive writing. But I want you to see that this could really work for anything that you have to teach them. Some things are going to be better, you know, in terms of more, more uh, appropriate than other things. But if I'm, I'm coming to you, if I want to speak on the present tense, and I'm looking at designing a leaflet promoting AIDS awareness. Oh, okay, Bernice, I'm going to shut up. All right, go ahead, Bernice, I'm not speaking again. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, I was taking your idea. Um, for future tense or Good. tenses. Yep. yep. For Good. even for ones. Yes, and this, this is the kind of thing that could work for, for a number of tenses um, at the same time, couldn't it? So, so it depends on how you're, you're creating that leaflet. But good. That's, that's the point. that you, you, you contextualize. This is really a context. And you can teach just about almost any language element through this context. All right? Um, now, I want you to look at three, right? Write a newspaper article biased against a girl who died after a botched abortion. Again, something that's so common that happens. But the issue here is that our Caribbean students have become so used to hearing these things that it, it almost doesn't matter to them when it is brought up, okay? Now, a major issue with that is that, and we said it in classes before, the students have to connect with what they're learning in order to learn effectively. If I have no feelings about what I'm doing, then it's going to reflect itself in the way I write, okay? It, it means I'm going to be mundane, monotonous, my sentences are going to be simple, um, you know, I'm not going to have a very broad vocabulary, that kind of, that kind of idea. Now, focus with me now. If I gave this as an assessment, what is in your mind one of the main things that would have to be in my lesson? If I'm given this as an assessment, what, what for you, and we'll all have different main things, there's no correct answer, okay? But what would be a main thing that would have to be in the lesson for this assessment or assignment to be effective? Content about AIDS. No, three, three Bernies. Oh, sorry, my bad. Um, three. Well, I guess content is about. <laughs> I was just going to say, change, change the topic. Yeah. Okay, so we need to have content about, about abortion, but guess what? 
how I'm going to bring across that content is going to be vital. The student is not going to be able to give me the type of assessment I would like to see coming from the student, capable, that the student is capable of doing, if I don't conduct that lesson in a certain way. So how am I going to bring up about the content of that situation of abortion? I have to think of how I'm going to bring it across. How I'm going to bring it across is going to be really determining how that student, how well that student is going to do in this assessment. Talk to me about the things now that that student would have to have learned in the lesson in order to write an effective newspaper article on a botched abortion. What would the student have had to have learned? Some form of letter writing because it could be a letter to the editor. Some form of letter writing because it could be a letter to the editor. That was you, Carrie Dean? Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, that's excellent. So, what you've just said there is an understanding that we cannot only look at content, we have to look at other areas of what I will call skills. Remember, the students have to do. The content is actually usually the easiest part of it. To get them to know what you want them to know, that's fine. Being able to do it is a whole different ball game. So I have to equip them in my lesson to get them to move to that point in their assessment. So it could be a letter to the editor, so I need to give them the format of that. What else would I have to give them so they could write that letter effectively? Well, there is obviously a background story because they are writing in a bias against a girl who had an abortion. What's the story behind that? Okay, good. All right. Now, can yes, go ahead. Can they look at medical facts and um, the debilitating effects that these things can that, that these things can uh, cause, and then from there, now they're asked to write a newspaper article against this, um, this, this thing. Yeah, and that would be one of the things. I wouldn't say that would be it, but scientific, and I'm glad you brought it up, because scientific information is going to be key here, because this is a botched abortion, okay? So, so it means they have to understand that vocabulary term, botched, first of all, and if they're going to really get into the heart of it for them to be able to write an article biased against a girl who died after a botched abortion, they're going to have to have scientific evidence. They're going to have to have something more than just me saying, no, I believe abortion is wrong, or yes, I believe abortion is right. It has to be more than that. They need substance, okay? What we have to be careful about and what CLT allows um, ladies and gentlemen, is that you are equipping the students with skills as well, okay? You cannot test, you cannot assess them on something that they have not been taught. It would be unfair. So you can't assume, well, everybody knows about abortion, so let me give this topic. It's unfair to do that. Because I myself would have to be reading up as the teacher to figure out how certain things operate, okay? So, and I'm saying it because especially for fourth and fifth form, this is a frequent practice. We come in because it's an exciting topic. We assume that they're equipped because they'll get excited about the topic, but they may not have the content, right? And of course, this is encouraging them to read. So scientific evidence has to be brought in. Letter format has to be brought in. What else? Checklist as far as um, just uh, kind of giving them some guidelines as to okay, okay, good, and 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 yes, that's important up there. Um, and and you could give them from two standpoints. You could you could give them from what a newspaper article is supposed to do, right? What you know at the end of the day, remembering always never to forget the audience remember for everything you give the students they must have an audience okay so they have to think about who's going to be reading this newspaper article 
right? Who is likely to read it? Who's likely to be interested in it? So that, that would go on the checklist. And then, of course, you go back to the situation of the botched abortion, right? You cannot be, you're going to, you remember, you're also teaching life skills. One of the worst things to do is to write a newspaper article where you're not knowledgeable, where you're showing quite, you know, you have people tracing off other people about it all the time, right? So you write this very passionate, you know, overwhelmingly emotional um, letter about something, but then it turns out that based on what happened, okay, so that's, that's important for them as part of that checklist too is, is what they know about it. All right. Um, let's look at the last one. I think it's very obvious what they would be doing. Um, general, the last one is the elements of language. And when I say elements, I'm looking now at elements like parts of speech, figurative uses of language, um, tenses, punctuation. I'm looking at those language elements. So forget the broad topics like persuasive writing, report writing, etc. for now. There's a construct. All right. Now, what language elements could I teach in that lesson that can be brought out through this assessment? Hello. Five years later. Good night, Rochelle. How great of you to join us on this auspicious occasion at 6 30. Wow. <laughs> okay, I thought you were going to zoom in. I don't know. Uh, oh, okay. We won't go there. All right. Okay. Any answers for me yet? Karina, Karina, you cool? Oh, it's it's showing. You both of you have the same position, so you can't turn it down, turn it up, run up. The remote. The two of you are folding arms, and you it, it had is you pay a vex with each other, or are you are cold? All right. You don't have the remote in there to turn it up. You should have the remote. No. Guess no. not. All right. Who's ready to ask me? Janice. I haven't heard Janice in a while, which is uh, Janice. Right here. Yes. You want to be right there. Right there, because I'm normally hearing you all the time. And, uh, I'm Janice, talk to me. <laughs> How nice of you. Um, all right. Talk to me about the last of and I could teach there and I give you some <laughs> take my head James figurative <laughs> devices uh, parts of speech punctuation what else did I say you could have types of sense uh, punctuation tenses you could have so many right. things mm -hmm. Simile. So you teach them similes, and why would you? What? what hmm. And what would you have taught them in the lesson that would allow for this assessment to be? Wow. Oh, making. Um. Make this the use of comparison so they could compare. I don't know. Um. Okay. So simile came to your uh, mind for a reason. Do you know why? I was thinking like they were saying, um, because you're doing advertising and the, the main purpose of it is, is to appeal to people to get them. Okay, to so somebody came to your you. mind for a reason. Do you know why? So if you're saying, um, good, uh, I'm trying to use simile and then the poise is just throwing me off. <laughs> well, I was going to say that maybe the poise is the best place to start. What do you guys think? Isn't, isn't, isn't um, a comparison automatically um, subsumed in that sentence right there? In that, think about it. You're going to create an, an, advers an advertisement for a perfume called poison. Poison by itself already gives you this, this denotative meaning. We looked at that 
the last class, this dictionary definition, we, we, we think of a certain thing when we think of poison, but it's the perfume, right? So there has to be something that's going to be compared to get my audience's attention, to get them to think that this poison is like the perfume, that it's not poison to kill you off, <laughs> all right? Because that would become a problem and I will not sell the perfume. So. Give me a give me a sentence with as and as. As poison. As strong as poison. Shake my head. <laughs> okay. Um, let's try again. Okay. Okay. I'm so tired as that time of the evening. They would definitely have run out of that. Word. You're saying strong because you're thinking of scent. Am I correct? Fragrance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, so a strong. Is what? Think something that could be connected with. Because I created a you get answered in the question. Wanna do have one sentence with us and us? I'm not hearing you, Bernice. Go again. As, as strong as a lion. As strong as a lion. Give me a second sentence. We need to link it to poison. As strong as a lion. Does it have to be with, Does it have to be with what? I'm hearing two questions. Go on again. One at a time. No, my Janice. I was just saying as effective as poison. <laughs> as effective as poison, but we'd need another word, not effective. Deadly. As as poison. No, mine didn't really make much sense. I was just okay, but am I gonna sell that perfume with deadly? <laughs> it's an oxymoron. So why we need Let me think. Let me think. No, absolutely. What what is this? Okay, so what is this telling you that you'd have to provide you'd have to provide a student with? The um attributes of poison. Very good. You would have to to provide the student, but you'd have to provide a situation where the students, before they construct this advertisement, are going to be asked to look at the different ways in which poison can be articulated, okay? The different meanings. And then you're going to have to look at perfume and what are the things that people like about perfume. So the students are going to begin to choose from the list of words attached to poison those things that can now be ascribed to. A bottle of perfume. Why I'm saying this is because it looks simple when you give that, doesn't it? It looks like a very simple thing to do. Construct an advertisement for a perfume called poison. But very often we don't equip them with what is needed for them to construct that advertisement. We just think it's a really cool uh, thing to do. Children love doing advertisements. It's colorful and gets them all excited. But we have to also equip them. Is there anything else they would need to know? Persuasive techniques. Okay. okay. Good. And persuasive techniques would be important because? It would help them because they're selling something. So they, they want people to, to catch their, the people's attention and buy. Precisely. Okay. And, and what? 
you're doing, again, no, believe it or not, what they're going to be able to read and understand them, they're going to be able to create them, and they're going to be able to critique them, right? They're going to be able to look and say, well, you didn't put that, and why didn't you do that? By the time they, they move along that spectrum to fifth um, form for Caribbean territories anyway, when they're looking at that, at that section of the exam, there's usually a comprehension piece. Some of you know it. It's a persuasive writing comprehension piece. And very often, there is a per, uh, an advertisement. And the students are asked up to six questions on that advertisement. Teachers usually simply think they need to go through the questions, but the student doesn't have the awareness or the knowledge of what actually is involved in creating an advertisement. So they're just looking at it from a stage. They're just looking at it from a very basic point of view. When they have a thought lacks what it doesn't lack, they know where to see X, they know what the writer is trying to do with the way that they, he or she has styled it X. So I'm trying to show you that this one form of assessment could end up doing so many things, could teach them so many things, and at the same time, ends up honing skills that can be used in exam-oriented classrooms. Okay, um, because you, you, somebody say, I, yes. Sorry about that, my, my computer battery died. I had oh, to revert. Then. Okay. You got what you I got? The, the comparison. No, no, we has, haven't. We've okay. gone a little bit okay. beyond it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, what I used it to do, the point is you need time to write them. Okay. And that's, that's the point. And, and you need time to write them, and you also need content you need you need to have material with which you're going to write them okay. yeah if not I'm, I'm causing you to focus as a student on so many different things that you may lose the point right and so what i'm saying is when you give an assessment like this or anything or any form of assessment always look to see that you have equipped them throughout the lesson with what they need to fulfill the requirement of the assessment that's it construct an advertisement. Um, it doesn't say if it's written or if it's um, video or something like that. Yes. So I was thinking um, maybe in, in that case, we might want to have some kind of guideline as to what we're looking Good. for. Because at first I was in my head, I was scratching because I was what like, kind? man, is this, what yeah, what kind? I mean, it could have been if it's an advertisement that's in a magazine, we might want yep. or a newspaper might want Good. something kind yep. of more written. But if it's on TV, yeah. Um, and, and so this this would have been a written a written a mix like an illustrated type of, of thing, more like as you just said, what's in a magazine. But I agree with you. You'd, we'd have to be specific about the type of advertisements. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think you got my point with that with that um, with those. I'm gonna leave these for you to do. All right, um, so I'm just going to focus on the summary points. You'll see the activities later on. Um, and I'll, I'll send you some examples. Let me just move this. All right, so the bottom line is assessment in a CLT classroom is considered, ought to be considered a functional activity. It recognizes the fact that understanding what the learners or learner knows must be gauged in context and must be evaluated as performance overall, okay, based on everything they've done. But as you see it there, it must be grounded in context, all right? There is also, Milner and Milner um, have stated, there's interdependence of knowledge, thought, and performance. And performance here is not dealing with drama. Performance here is dealing with the action of the student, the fact that the student does something to demonstrate that he or she understands, okay? Performance is knowledge in action. And, and what tends to be missing, as I, I close it off, what tends to be missing is the inaction, all right? Because of the fact that the students tend to be given assessment pieces which really try to show off kind of thing that the way the teacher has taught rather than what the student actually knows. All right, and you'll hear that, you're in staff rooms, you hear, my students did, my students did, that kind of thing. We have performance-based um, teaching in some places. I know Jamaica is vying for it now. And so the idea is that the, the higher the grade, 
the better the teacher, but that's actually not necessarily the case. There are too many variables that can cause a student to do well. Those of you who have children will realize that. Um, you plugging a lot of uh, at home, the child ends up with a certain grade and the teacher might be taking accolades for it when you, at the end of the day you knew that if you didn't plug in that work at home, that grade might not have been you know, the, the same. You also have students who are very gifted. I say it all the time that there are students who don't necessarily need us, but they're glad they have us, <laughs> okay? Um, so you have a lot of variables that will contribute to the performance of a student. It's never good to think that I am the sole, um, what's that now, the, 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 the only person contributing to that performance. But the bottom line is we have to have student-centered, learner-centered classrooms where there is performance in or, or, or knowledge in action, okay? Um, so the focus with the CLT approach to assessment is that it concentrates on using rather than having knowledge. And if there's any statement that I want you to remember at the end of all of this, that's what it is. It concentrates on using rather than having knowledge. If at the end of the day, the student has all of this knowledge but cannot use it, we have an effect not effectively taught. All right? Okay. Any questions? Uh, miss? Yep, go ahead. I'm trying to find you. Having and um, not using, would an exam be way that, well, I don't necessarily believe that the exam really tests your knowledge. So that's where my question is coming from. So, will that be the only test of your understanding of that knowledge? Right. So, so I needed to say it for, I didn't hear the first part of the quote. What was the question that you're asking? If a, an exam can? If an exam is the test to show that you have learned whatever you have, you have been taught. Yeah, an exam, typically, typically, you do have some extraordinary exams. Singapore has extraordinary exams. Um, typically, an exam is merely testing what you know. Yes? Um, and so the, the focus of that is you're having knowledge, typically. There are, however, and CXC is really trying, there are, however, exams that try to, to give the student an opportunity to use knowledge rather than merely show that they have the knowledge. So use, so that the, the type of, the way a question is phrased will tell you the difference. If a question is very literal, then it's going to be looking at you just throwing down the knowledge. The higher up the question gets on that um, critical level thinking skill, scale is what will tell you if the, 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 the test is focused on using rather than having. So if I give you a scenario, I'm definitely wanting you to use the knowledge, not just demonstrate that you have it. If I give you a multiple choice item, I'm, it's likely that I'm focused on you having the knowledge and not using it. So what about persons that can perform well in the exam, but, but they know? All right. Personally, and it has to be personally because we have so many different opinions on this. Personally, there are, there are such cases. There are students who do not perform well on exams, but I am going to suggest psychologically, Rochelle, that 80% of the time, if the student was able to access why it was that they're not performing, it would have nothing to do with the subject. 80% of the time, it has to do with the individual. And if the individual gets the correct strategy, I've seen it over and over, the problem is gone. Yeah? Because if, if, if you think about it, if, if you're doing an exam for language and you're doing an exam for psychology and you're doing an exam for educational technology and each exam is a problem, it can't be the content. Unless, of course, you're a delinquent, which I'm assuming, you know, we're not dealing with that case. We're dealing with a case with a student who genuinely tries and genuinely studies hard, but is just not able to pass the exam. That usually is a strategy issue. Okay? There's something that's happening within the individual. The mind shuts down literally because the student is doing an exam. Have, I've seen it all the time. I've had students who... Do, well, excellent in their oral presentations, brilliant in coursework, and then you look at the final paper, when you realize who it is, you're in shock, okay? And it, it is simply that student struggles in exams. So it does happen, but I'm not one of those who believes that it can't change. I've seen it change. It just The individual just needs to get the right assistance, I believe. Yeah? 
Mind you, um, student-centered learning suggests that we move away from an ex exam orientation type of base. So many people in the world have done that. Let's hope we get on that bandwagon soon. Any other questions, comments? Okay, all right. So um, next week, so this was our, our last teaching unit, teaching a unit class. Next week, what we have is revision. So next week, you're going to get a lot of practical work, okay? You'll be given scenarios. You'll be given situations that are going to be um, exemplary of what you'll get on the exam. And you'll be asked to work in pairs, sometimes individually, most times in pairs, to respond to them and to throw them out. So the revision, as I explained last week, the revision is not going to take the place of me sitting up here saying, okay, let's go through everything from the beginning, okay? The scenarios and the questions you get will be going through things that we've done from the start. We'll assume that, you know, you have acquired that knowledge. And, and of course, we'll, we'll take you through the, the ways to respond to these questions, okay? And you'll also get the exact um, topics that are coming so that you don't have to um, overkill in terms of studying. All right. I'm still trying to work out the exact date for the test. I know the 23rd and the 24th are out. Um, I would like it to not be in the 30th week because, as I said, I need you to submit your, your um, assignments then. I don't, want, I don't really want it to go over. Um, but it really depends on what, what they're able to tell me about when you're doing your other uh, tests slash exams. All right, so you'll know that by the end of this week at the latest. All right. <coughs> All right. Okay, I'm going to look very tired and half dead. <laughs> All right, understandably. All right, um, so remember... And, and just setting the premise that Kareem said today, if you need to speak with me, please do so, right? Um, we can meet via Skype. Um, I don't have my, Isha Hutch is my Skype name. You can add my Skype name because we can do, we, Skype is, is much easier. Um, and you can reach me anytime and I'll let you know if we can speak or not because I keep Skype on my personal phone, right? So it's I S H A. H-U-T-C-H, -H. Isha Hutch, I-S-H-A-H-U-T-C-H. -H -H. That's how you can get me on Skype. Um, or, of course, you can send me a WhatsApp and let me know if there are questions. I have a question. Okay. Good question. Go ahead. Ten seconds. Um, back to the composition. If, you write, if they're writing a composition, um, you were saying that if they're writing paragraphs, one sentence leading into another, it's better than um, fragmented sentences or disjointed sentences. So if if, I, if, yeah, if you're giving them sentences, yes. Okay. Because so, in other words, just because of what you're saying, because they're going to eventually write things like compositions, yeah, that, that you want to show them how sentences operate, you want to show them how sentences work. Sentences do not operate or should not operate in fragments okay. or in a fragmentary way, right? So you don't want to give one, two, and they're totally different in thought. Now, um, what about writing an essay? Does uh -huh. that also have a greater context when you're telling them, okay, look at the picture, maybe use some target words? Does it also have to be contextualized? I think Wesley had brought it up earlier, and I was saying that the context of an essay usually is the format, not necessarily the content. So um, like Carrie Dean was saying, write a letter to the editor, that establishes a context. If you say that, um, and I think that's the, the example I gave Wesley earlier, if I'm saying, okay, we're going to have a collection of... Um, where I'm coming from is the title. And we're going to have a collection in a portfolio of all the classes entries of where I'm coming from. And each student has to write an essay that is autobiographical in nature based on, based on a topic. The important thing there is the format. They're writing it for me and their parents and anybody else who wants to read. It's a class um, portfolio. 
that kind of thing. It's purposeful because they're writing about themselves and the other people are reading, that kind of thing. So, so the, the, the thing with context where essays are concerned, don't feel that the content, the topic itself, it must be relevant, but it may not always have that exact context. What needs to have the context is why would they be writing it? What's the purpose for them writing it? That's where the context needs to be established. Understood? And so there needs to be one for even essay writing. Um, I think the key with essay writing is a checklist. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I'm saying, and I'm saying to, to, to say, to say write an essay on my life or write an essay on should girls date at 16. It, 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 you, they need to have an audience. They, they need to understand why they're writing that essay. Where, where is it going? What's it, you know, even if it's a simulated thing, even if it's imaginary, it's not a problem. But they need to understand where something like this would fit in. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, you know how to contact me if you need me. And we will talk further during the week. All right. Have a good night. All right. Take care. Thank you. And the same to you, Doc. All righty. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Dana, Dana, come here. Wait there. Look at who pocket that booty. Look at Sana. Look at who pocket that. 
Not really. Mm. Not really. Not really. What's up? Bye. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't get my gaga. I don't I I could have a little bit of 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 a little